Hello, everybody. I'm Bobby Arapchev, SEO strategist at Serpact. I have more than 15 years in SEO experience. Uh, my focus is uh, content, brand awareness, and uh, local SEO. My name is Dido. I'm the head of SEO at Serpact with almost 15 years in SEO, and my focus technical SEO, content optimization, and semantic SEO. Uh, as, as you know, this is SERPAC4 webinar, and we are very excited, very happy to start this with uh, Dawn Anderson. Let me introduce her. Dawn Anderson is a lecturer on uh, search and uh, digital marketing strategy at Manchester University. Also, she runs on digital marketing and international SEO consultancy agency, Move It Marketing, based in Manchester, UK. And also, has been a speaker at the leading UK and international uh, marketing conferences. There are so many, much like PubCon, Las Vegas and Florida, European Search Conference, Search Leads, Brighton SEO, SMX London, SMXC, Engage London, Engage Las Vegas, Moscon, State of Search, Dallas, USA. And uh, also, down is the UK, EU, and uh, US Search Awards, George. Uh, hello, Dawn. Um, so, uh, you're one of the top persons when it comes to the ACO industry and community uh, who talks about the semantic algorithmic side of ACO. I'm talking about information retrieval and machine learning and neural networks we have. We had several discussions with you uh, about neural networks and machine learning over the way, uh, particularly on with Facebook. So, uh, share some more info about you with our audience. How did you start with SEO? Uh, what inspires you in SEO? And what is the most interesting part of SEO for you? Besides information and tool, and along with that, of course. Okay. Well, first, may I say thank you for inviting me to speak to your your guests. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, as Dido mentioned, uh, I'm Dawn Anderson. I've been in SEO for 12, nearly 13 years now. And um, I got into SEO basically through, uh, well, through necessity because I was working on my own projects, really struggling to find somebody that uh, really could do anything effectively with, uh, with my original website for SEO. So I started to learn myself. Uh, and I found that I actually really loved love the topic and obviously like the rest of us it kind of becomes an obsession over the years and we just want to learn more and more more uh in 2012 i decided to expand my knowledge more and went off and took a master's in digital strategy overall across all the channels because as we know seo doesn't operate in a silo it really needs to be part of uh, the wider uh digital offering so it made sense uh, and obviously the thing that excites me most about um, SEO is the rapid change the constant constant necessity to learn and the community is really good as well uh, we can all learn of each other I became really interested in the information retrieval side of search which kind of is one and the same in around I don't know 2012-13 uh, when I started to buy books on ontology, etc., uh, and then um, I started going to some conferences to learn more. I went to Wisdom 2017 in Cambridge, and that really blew my mind. And since then, I've avidly read lots of books. I have so many books on information retrieval, lots of papers, uh, and uh, I, yeah, I, I just love it. Yeah, it's it is a never-ending rabbit hole. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we all have uh, uh, that uh, green uh, that green book about information retrieval. It's the foundation written by uh, Google's, and uh, the most of information we can use uh, as a foundation is there, so we can start and build in our knowledge uh, based upon these um, yeah. upon the models there. One really great book which is mm. like a core textbook used by every single computer science student that's studying information <coughs> is called Modern Information Retrieval by mm -hmm. Ricardo Piazza Yates, who is the ex-VP of research at Yahoo Labs. He's a professor at the University in Barcelona, 
and he's a semantic engineer with a commercial organization now so he's been a computer scientist for you know many many years and his book is the go-to on the current you know cutting edge stuff particularly around things to do with the temporal dynamics of the web how fast things change and how to respond to those queries quickly um but for search engines because obviously every organization is not without resource limitations including search engines as we know one of the biggest expenses for search engines is their electricity bill so crawling the web which is growing at a massive speed speed all requires some efficient processes and um, i know that a lot of ricardo's writings in those books um around efficiency for search engines and we can then translate that into seo because you know crawling is a very big deal and making sure that we get the most from a crawl allocation and i'm going to say the word crawl budget i think it's overused by seos i think a lot of people don't understand it i think that they might have a 500 page website but then they think oh my god my crawl budget yeah well you know it's not really going to impact you the big issues are the sites with poor SEO and massive pages where there becomes an issue. But anyway, back to the, the book, which I always recommend is Ricardo Beers and Yates's. It's huge, well worth reading, even if it takes you a year or two years. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about the modern information with you of, of Ricardo Baeza? Yeah, 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 I know it. I know it. It's a really, really great book and is as an addition, um, as extension of knowledge to the to the green book, we all know. Um, <clears throat> what do you think? Uh, so um, let's start with uh, the mobile first indexing first and go to the mobile information with you because we really believe that both of them are interlinked. Okay. And uh, yeah, so um, how would you explain mobile first indexing from technical and semantics perspective in your uh, opinion? And at all, um, how do you think that uh, mobile first is changing uh, the search technologies today. Okay, so uh, if I'm uh, if I'm fully answering, fully understanding the question, so from a, uh, I think that there, there's some fundamental differences now. Mm -hmm. One in the past, uh, well, I don't think you necessarily need to have huge, 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 huge masses of words to get across an intent uh, a message now unless the page is being built by you for for long form reading yeah so i know that there's like lots of guides out there etc etc there maybe some of them are like nine thousand words long but i think you can use certain user experience uh functionalities for mobile first index because if you notice on the search results these days on mobile and even on desktop, there's an awful lot of these little jumps mm -hmm. within pages. So Google is trying to help people get mm -hmm. to the main, the most precise point, not only on a website, but in an actual page itself. And we saw recently mm -hmm. with AMP that Google highlighting the relevant snippet with orange. So, for instance, so UX is massively important now with mobile first indexing. If you know anything about guest out principles, I think a lot of those are being certainly picked up on and considered both in Google's mobile first index and in terms of that as a website, because bear in mind, I think sometimes we we find it's easy for us to forget that actually google.com, google.co.uk, etc. they're really just Google's websites, yeah. So, Obviously, they are the search engine results pages, but they are like a website with search results in them. And they are also, in my view, and I'm reading a lot of books on uh, mobile information retrieval and UX combined, because I think I think you have to re do the, read the two together. Mobile user experience is completely different. Yeah, it's 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 very much around images, icons that that uh, tell people what a thousand words might be able to tell them, you know, like the little uh, envelope sign means email, etc. So it's a lot of picto pictographic, if you like. Um, and I think that what Google are doing is they're actually 
changing their their website to be more in line with guest art principles. I don't think it's any coincidence that Luke Rebelsky, who was the who was uh, the first person to coin the phrase mobile first design, um, works at Google right uh, now. So, and he, he coined the phrase mobile first design from a UX and website design perspective. So I think all of these go together. For me, Google's re redesigning their website to be mobile first, uh, as we all are. I think we can learn a lot from that. What are they doing? What are they doing to help with UX? I think if we can start to implement some of those things on our own sites, then we're, we're part way there. Uh, thank you, so, Dan. Uh, uh, Dan, uh, here is my question. Uh, do you believe that the quality signals of Google for a website will be slightly or completely changed now in the era of uh, mobile first index? Quality signals of Google? Uh, no. Or well, I think that they're constantly trying to work on their quality signals all the time. Uh, I mean, obviously, there is like the cold war on spam that's never going to end. Uh, so that's always going to be rinsed out and checked. And, to the, you know, the, there's a reason why it's called search quality, <laughs> because mm -hmm. the web spam team is called search quality because they're fighting web spam and they're trying to improve the quality of the search results. So I think that that's constantly something that, like the rest of us, the all search engines are looking to improve upon that and pr produce user happiness ultimately is the main thing and if you've ever come across what they call the heart framework i can't remember who it's by actually but look that up the heart framework i think she's called kerry actually she's again she's a google she's a ux researcher uh and it's all around user happiness metrics for user happiness brilliant framework so i think that they're trying to satisfy those uh, metrics in uh, in the results that they return, yeah. And don't forget, the results are not the only part of a Google website. It's all the UX as well, it's the interaction, it's what are people clicking, are they clicking accordions, are they clicking, are they opening these new light boxes that are on video? So it's not even just about the results, it's about the containers that results are in as well. So I think, A, they'll always be working on quality because Everybody is always looking to iteratively improve, including ourselves. And B, I think that the relevant the context, uh, the context will increasingly matter because obviously contextual search, i.e., understanding not just what somebody means, but the situation that somebody's in when they make a uh, perform a query. You know, are they crossing the road with them looking with one hand and one eye on their mobile, or are they? sat in front of a desktop that's like massive screen, static, uh, are they moving at a certain distance, you know, accelerometer on the phone, um, imply that if they're moving very slowly, they're walking, if they're running, it's going very fast. So I think that, the, that everything matters in that regard, but quality will always matter and increasingly so, and that's a good thing. Uh, this user happiness, uh sounds really good you say mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh, is there something we can do any best practices to be applied so we can uh, prepare our websites for mfi what do you think uh so obviously there is the the issue of uh, content parity so if you've not been switched on the mobile first index and i know there has been like there seems to be like I think two or three main waves of people being switched over. The main last wave last week was seemed to handle a lot of quite tricky websites. I know that uh, a couple of the trickier websites, larger sites that I either consult on or work on myself went over, which obviously is quite a relief because you think, oh my god, I'm not going to ever get switched over. Uh, that when that happened, and I know that AJ Code made a point that. Last week, uh, he's, he, he noticed that a, a significant number of uh, large websites went across that he was aware of or had insights into Google Search Console. And then what we can do, mm -hmm. A, obviously speed is quite a big deal. I, 
I do know I think speed is a really important thing. But I do see a lot of SEOs that are obsessed on speed when they already have a fast website. Yeah. Uh so even John Mueller said, look, if you've already got a fast website, you have to weigh up whether it's actually worth all the time and effort that it might take to make it unbelievably fast when actually it's in the fast range anyway. Yeah. And um, what about if you are <coughs> largely still a desktop based audience? Okay, so at some point you're going to get there. But you have to look at the demographics of your audience. If your audience is uh, in a demographic group, you have to look at analytics and see who you use for that, what are they using. If they're still mostly desktop, then you know you might not necessarily need to be optimizing for mobile speed yeah, massively because it's a ranking factor, but it's still one of very, very many ranking factors. Ultimately, I see a lot of people, and I mean, I'm a huge fan, as you know, of technical SEO as you are, but I see a lot of people say, oh, and my technical SEO is amazing, but actually they don't have the content on the website to rank. So they have a, they have a site about dogs, the fastest dog site in the world, but they're trying to rank for cats. They don't look at the actual content or the topical relevance within the site because they tend to, tend to be a little bit pigeonholed uh, in their mind into technical SEO. So I think, and as I said, I'm a great fan of technical SEO. I'm a great fan of all aspects of SEO. I think each has to complement each other and work together. And it's very important that actually you know, you can't run for something you haven't got the content for or the relevance for. So, hope that answers that. So, work on content, work on understanding what content matters to when and to whom, and work on uh, being as uh, concise and brief as you can, unless the piece is actually <coughs> a piece that actually requires comprehension a very long piece mm -hmm. for the purposes of you know providing long form guides or whatever yeah and actually don't forget images and video because they are massively popular on uh well mm -hmm. yeah. you know that's where some of the fastest speed wins are optimizing images images are great for <coughs> there's often lots of traffic and particularly in some niches images and videos to go to fitness, uh, e-commerce, fashion, anything with a visual representation. So I hope those pointers help a bit. Okay. Uh, so uh, what do you think, what are the most common mistakes made by people when it comes to mobile force indexing? Uh, we have all observed uh, um, all people uh, trying to do something when it comes to mobile force indexing. Um, they, they started um, uh, discussing over the web that uh, you should do that uh, or this and you will be better ranked or something like that. Um, what do you think are the most common mistakes in, this, uh, in these practices? Uh, I think one of the, I think one of the uh, biggest, uh, it's not a mistake, but I think, I think not moving across to a responsive website is probably something that most brands at some point will regret. I know a couple of organizations that are kind of fairly, fairly adamant about having the two separate sites, etc. instead of working on just one. And you end up with uh, quite a lot of uh, code uh, inconsistencies between the two sites. One of the platforms tends to get neglected Sometimes they're just pulling content from one site into the other without uh, realizing that it causes canonical issues and some pages are not even getting indexed. Uh, so I think I think the main point is if, you, if it's not on your radar, go to responsive. Most sites are <coughs> certainly on some of the more tricky sites that are pulling maybe data and maybe JavaScript uh, mm -hmm. sites. Um, it's not that easy just to switch it all over. And mm -hmm. you get a lot of SEOs who say, oh, everybody should do this. But in the harsh reality of life on bigger sites, that's not the case. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. They may be old, they may have many iterations and a lot of patchwork quilt going on behind the scenes where people have decided, oh, we're going to go to this technology, we're going to add this technology, etc. Mm -hmm. With lots of good ideas added by lots of different departments over, you know, 10, 20 years. That's not easy to just immediately switch to one responsive site. So I would be thinking mm -hmm. all the time, probably best to start and try and get together a plan about integration and consolidation. I know that Google shared a really interesting piece uh, about a week or so ago. Uh, it was actually the in-house SEO team that said, this is our approach to SEO. A, do things steadily and slowly. B, consolidate, I think, instead to merge. Find out what you have. You know, I know organisations that have no clue what domain names they own. Yeah. They've got that many. They don't know who, who knows. They don't know who, who owns what. And they don't actually know who actually is the person responsible for knowing who actually owns the domains. And they've been from one agency to another over the years or they've had many iterations of people in their team and there's i think the thing is to just make sure one and this doesn't just apply to mobile first fitness and it applies to all aspects of seo and digital is keep mm -hmm. everyone informed as much as possible so that when people come and go there's at least at least you know who you're up to and that just goes mm -hmm. with everything so i think a common mistake is inconsistencies, not being responsive. I also see a lot of mm -hmm. people that are pulling in far too many, uh, they're either pulling in far too many images, far too many, see as much CSS. So for instance, they're just loading the whole bootstrap. Uh, they just downloaded the whole bootstrap style sheet, mm -hmm. downloaded that to the no, computer, well. and they're literally having <clears throat> to call the whole thing. Instead of going through it, seeing what you're actually using, minimizing that and just using something like unused CSS. Developer Tools actually has something really great for that in the uh, console there, where you can see which parts of CSS you're using, which parts of JavaScript you're using, and actually then just export that, but make sure you go through each template or page on your site to ensure you don't end up leaving things behind that are needed. So, Images should have a lot of focus when it comes to mobile first payments in. Either making sure they're included, making sure you're not calling things you don't need, but also one other thing as well that I, I spotted the other day is when uh, you end up with um, <coughs> people that people edit their CSS file and they leave some styles, some styles in for some devices. And they don't leave some styles in for others. So in actual fact, what happens is images of certain devices don't get called then. Yeah, because there's no paths as such. So look in search console, see what's being blocked. Look on developer tools, all the different devices by toggling device, see what happens, and you'll go over to mobile first, you know, when they're ready then. It's about parity uh, of everything. And being able to ensure everything is fetched by Google, use uh, the mobile first uh, checker up the, the mobile friendly test being not being pulled, and also things like the structured data testing tool, which is also really useful, and obviously page feed insights. So many tools out there. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, have you noticed recently that uh, many people are making the mistake to um, to have any? Uh, actually, it's not a, a mistake because most of the people are not developers. But uh, uh, sometimes they just forget about the viewport, or they don't understand it properly, or uh, they just make some, uh, let's say, header and footer menus, and uh, all the, all these links are too close to each other. Uh, yeah. So is the, the Google console starts triggering some um, errors and uh, they're kind of frightened sometimes and they're kind of shocked. Uh, what's going on? I will be demoted by Google. My website will never have, have uh, I see um, the great rankings I would like to see and so on. Um, uh, yeah. How do you think these are so fundamental? Okay, so obviously I think they're important. Yes, very, very important, yeah, uh, because 
everybody, you know, you should have like a, <coughs> a mobile, uh, a site actually has uh, enough uh, space between uh, tar targets. So things like, I see a lot on unordered lists where uh, by default, uh, the, the uh, unordered list, bullet list, in other words, doesn't have enough space between the points yet. So actually that's a, that's a big one. But um, what I do think is that there's obviously a lot of messages going out from Google Search Console now. Personally, I think they need to add something that actually adds a severity level to those mm -hmm. messages because I see so many and I think site owners see so many, they'll eventually become ignorant to them. Yeah. They will become they'll just start ignoring them eventually. Yeah. Because the SEO comes back and says, Oh, that was just that. It was just this. It doesn't matter. Blah blah blah. Oh, it was such a false property. Mm -hmm. So eventually what happens with that, you become blind to all of the messages and you just actually start to ignore them. So I think they need to add in there a severity level. This is a warning, mm -hmm. this is a notice, this is a important and serious error, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And especially when we see these uh, trigger terrors, um, uh, we should have more information about them because they usually show uh, some click elements are too, too close to each other and so on, but we don't know why, we don't have enough details there on the and report. You know what as well, there's actually, I know the new search console is not that old. Uh, there's some mm -hmm. elements of the old search console which I wish that they hadn't got rid of. I found the crawler is really useful to actually just rebuild mm -hmm. the maps. Um, uh, so, you know, three or four or ones, et cetera, being able to redirect and find alternatives on a manual basis. And I know it was in an ordered list of importance, so I think it was good. Uh, I'm sad that that's kind of gone away. I don't think the search, the crawl stats was particularly, I thought it was useful, but I think a lot of people didn't really understand what was going on in the crawl stats anyway, because a lot of people didn't realize that it's actually every single bot, um, mm -hmm. not just Google bot for uh, SEO, if you like, or you know, uh, mobile. It was ad bot, AdSense bot, whatever. Um, and also it was, um, Every image, every file, every JavaScript file was called. It was literally just any path that was pulled. So I think that that didn't have enough information anyway to actually be useful, other than a massive spike, which you always get when you do a big update on a website. Um, but um, so I'm sad that that's gone. But in the new search console, I can see that there are. You know, obviously, in the coverage issue, a coverage page which has like performance, not performance, coverage which has um, errors and so on. I'm very frustrated with that at the moment. Um, I find there's a lot of po false positives going on. So it says something's not in the index. Then you check it is in the index. Apparently, I need to fully clarify this. And I know Glenn Gabe was looking at this as well. Mm -hmm. um, this is something to do with the two wave rendering potentially. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's obviously, that maybe has something to do with the fact that the page gets pulled uh, without all the assets attached, like images, JavaScript, and so on. And then when mm -hmm. you test it in another version, live version, it may have everything attached. So I think. This seems to be problematic on sites that load slowly as well. Almost like you can test it and you can see everything's there, but then if it takes ages to fetch images and JavaScript, it just seems that it fires an error. So it says, oh, it's not mobile friendly, because it's almost like it's not grabbed everything that was needed <coughs> together. Yeah. So A, I think that there needs to be some sort of um, severity levels on those emails on the notifications, because I'm getting clients that send them to me, and they're, they're worried, because obviously they get everything now that the site owners uh, have to console, and they don't know what they're about, but eventually they'll start ignoring them. So that then when they move over, to say, say they went to another agency, and that agency didn't 
bother with Search Console. And yes, you will be surprised that some actually don't spend, they don't look in Search Console, and specifically those that are not massively SEO focused. A huge amount of in house SEOs, huge amount of in house digital marketing teams for big brands never look in Search Console. Yeah. Um, so I just think they need to be, the messages need to be handled in a, a better way. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Down. Uh, Down, do you think that uh, there is uh, special tips for uh, creating content that will increase our ability to take future snippets? Uh, yes, yeah. There, yeah. I think that uh, well, first and foremost, what, what, what do you want to rank for? I'm not asking you specifically that. Uh, I think what you need to do is when you when you think of a term, instead of I mean obviously go and check in all the keyword research tools, but first and foremost, go and check in Google search, yeah. See what actual is actually is ranking. What is actually being pulled? Chances are it's an unordered list, it's uh, a table, tabular data. Uh, obviously the data is very well, it's easier to extract from web pages and ultimately a lot of feature snippets are extractions of data, known entities, if you like, yeah. Uh, and then the words around them, and obviously a lot of the results do come, tend to come from higher quality sites. Uh, so I think, A, make sure that you're adding lots of data and that the data is accurate, yeah. I have seen a number of sites that didn't keep event dates up to date or out of date and inaccurate data lost their feature snippet uh there's a time in events for instance there's a definitely a time focus as well uh when you look at mm -hmm. the events, uh google is usually going to be showing you the next next events in that genre so if you don't keep that event listing section updated or events page updated uh and with the most current at the top I think you drop away, yeah? So think about the nature of the query. Is there a temporal nature? With events, there definitely is. Reviews, obviously, I think that there's a trust element because that's, uh, and I think there's a crowd crowdsourcing element involved there. I read some papers, quite a lot of research papers on how <coughs> reviews are validated and there's two types of reviews. One is expert reviews, might be on the likes of tech radar or whatever. And then there's the crowdsourced reviews, which are the likes of Mumsnet or NetMums, where the whole crowd and audience comes in and gives their opinion on crowds. I did a slideshow on that, a talk I did on it, about how reviews uh, potentially are uh, double checked and verified. Again, those are academic papers. I see some evidence those techniques are certainly the likely results of those techniques are being produced or utilised in, um, in search and feature snippets. So it depends on the query. Is there a temporal nature? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so I, th I mean, I think a lot of it also ties in with conversational search because a lot of the results that come out mm -hmm. of search co correlate with featured snippets, yeah. And uh, a couple of years ago when I went to ESSIR, which is the European Summer School for Information Retrieval, one of the engineers from mm -hmm. Switzerland gave a lecture, which was amazing, on computational search and where they were up to with it and some of the challenges with it. Some of them are like tables that are challenging for voice search. I'm not sure whether that has changed since then. I would certainly say have two strategies in mind in your content, use tabular data, but also have content that is long form that actually adds the data outside of the table as well. I would always be thinking data, 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 and making sure you answer the question if you're looking to get questions there, uh, into direct answers, question answer, question answer, or use the entity at the beginning of the um, sentence, look out for things like disambiguation, massive, uh, so it's really clear what you're talking about. Yeah, so I hope there's a few answers there. There's a question from the audience. Yeah, we usually 
uh, ask you mm -hmm. it later, but if you want to answer now. Yeah. No well, do you want to do we leave it to the end and then we'll answer as soon as any more questions come through? Yeah. Yeah, we have a we have a question from our audience, YouTube audience. Is there a difference in SEO techniques for indexing? of large desktop optimized websites and large mobile websites um, uh, and large SPA. Uh, uh, and uh, and uh, uh, the question is about uh, pages with more than 10,000, uh, uh, websites with more than 10,000 pages. Um, well, the mobile first index still includes desktop uh, desktop websites. It says they're large desktop optimized website. I mean, I think they would, I would ask them to clarify that. Are they saying that the large desktop optimized website is not optimized for mobile as well? Absolutely, yeah, yeah I also are think they, so. These, are they saying these are not responsive websites? <coughs> are they saying that this is a, a different website to the mobile website. Are they talking about separate websites here? Are they talking about one that is dynamic serving that actually redirects the user dependent on their device? Uh, are they are they talking about an M dot? What what can they clarify maybe? Because obviously there are different ways to handle uh, different types of websites there. Obviously if you've got dynamic serving, then you'd use the Bari, Bari header to redirect. Mm -hmm. uh, and then obviously mm -hmm. they have the tricky issue with JavaScript, et cetera, to certainly, redir certainly redirect. Oh, that's the language of an SEO, goes to say the word direct and presumably, and automatically says the word redirect. <laughs> uh, I would direct them to, the, uh, to Google's help section on, uh, handling JavaScript uh, and Vari HTTP headers uh, for um, desktop devices or different different applications yeah so there there is there is there is a difference if it's separate websites and I think they need to just look at maybe you can share the link with them a bit later uh, but there definitely is a different way of things being handled uh <coughs> first index doesn't mean that you know the pages are not going to get indexed it just means that they are googlebot looks at them in different ways if you like it's, not mobile, mm -hmm. it's mobile first yeah mm -hmm. okay um, I mind if they do have just a desktop site if they have a mobile site and a desktop site the the what the pages that are going to get ranked or index are going to be the their performance is going to be based on the mobile side, so that that's going to make a difference. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, <clears throat> then jump uh, to the mobile information retrieval topic, our favorite topic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, let's start with yeah. Uh, let's start with uh, one of the. Introduction, introductory questions. Uh, what do you think is the difference between the traditional information material and the mobile one? And do you think that many of the principles and models of the traditional information material apply to the mobile one? I think that pretty much of the many of the principles and ranking models of the information material, especially for texts, they work on the mobile uh, side too. But let me let me hear your opinion. Yes. Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously, um, mobile information retrieval is a subset of information retrieval. So the foundation is what you can say. Uh, and um, the same as, uh, you know, there's so many different parts of information retrieval. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a really interesting, uh, interesting paper that was shared by Martin de Rijk, who's a very, very well-respected information retrieval researcher in Amsterdam. He's a professor now, mm -hmm. writes lots of papers. Uh, he produced a, a paper that he shared the other week that was published the other week called What Should We Teach in Information Retrieval? Yeah. So one thing I will say as well is, whilst he is primarily an academic, 
his connections with industry and they do go back and forth they all know each other so please don't think that he's, <coughs> well, he's only a research he's only an academic not so he could transfer his skills very easily to uh the, the search engine active search engine world yeah so mm -hmm. um, we should listen so you said what mm -hmm. should we uh, what should we uh teach in information retrieval and he listed off all the different types, which are subsets of information retrieval, such as uh, conversational research, uh, mm -hmm. conversational search, which is voice search, uh, mm -hmm. assist assistive search, which is Google Assistant, all the you know assistive search, assistive IR, um, bots, um, uh, mobile information retrieval, specifically for those on different mobile devices. And obviously mobile extends to anything like wearables, like Google Home, whatever. Um, so I think a lot of the core foundations are the same. Mm -hmm. Mobile information retrieval is one of the fastest growing in the field. Absolutely, book, yeah, uh, absolutely. I was reading a book uh, again by Fabio Cristani, again recommended. It's very small, I read it on my holiday. I know that some people think that's sad, I'm not a great fan of reading book, fiction books. Mm -hmm. I tend to read things that you know, because it does interest me. I'll be as much of a as much as is a mm. is a, a job. So I read that fully on the recent holiday on a cruise, which was great. Somebody in reading a book on mobile information retrieval, and it talked a lot about how mobile information retrieval is very much around understanding awareness is the biggest thing. How mm -hmm. search engines or those uh, targeting or sent, uh, returning informational needs or responding to informational needs on mobile devices understand uh, where the where the user is and what is the context? How mm -hmm. can they be aware? Yeah, how can they understand uh, whether somebody is walking at ten miles an hour? Is that fast? Probably it's quite fast. Whether they're walking really slowly, are they walking fast? Are they crossing the road? Are they getting off a bus? Uh, what is their attention span? Very short, very fragmented. It's very small tasks. It's very much like a short, sharp tasks. So being able to understand what might people want to save for later, I think it's no coincidence. Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely, you're absolutely right. Yeah, I think it's no coincidence just that Google is saying, "Hey, save this task for later," because mm -hmm. people get distracted, they break tasks. Mm -hmm. uh, people are not going to sit there and think, "Oh, I'm going to book a holiday. Oh, I'm going to sit here all day until I book a holiday." It's something that is part, it's like kind of a. It'll have many subtasks along the way. So mm -hmm. lots of research, which is also almost part of the holiday. Sometimes it's the best part of the holiday, you know, re researching, looking at pictures of swimming pools, sharing it with your friends on social media, saying what do you think. So it's understanding the behaviour of people. Uh, and I think there's also like more of an overlap with social media as well, because social is mobile and social go hand in hand. Mm -hmm, local mm -hmm. intent as well. I think people should really be doing a lot of tying in with Google My Business because sometimes that's actually the only thing that people will see on mobile. So that's another website that we have to be optimizing for and measuring because people don't even always hit your website. So you should be looking in the insights in Google My Business for the action people take and using that as part of your overall assets. Mm -hmm. and There's lots of differences. Mm -hmm. And uh, I see that uh, <coughs> mobile uh, information retrieval also implements very well the so-called multimedia retrieval. It's a very, very common topic uh, recently, uh, very discussed, and uh, Google started uh, you know, publishing some uh, patents on the, this technology for better understanding of images on mobile devices, tablets and mobile phones, uh, better understanding of videos, um, and understanding the uh, scripts of the videos and uh, the information and all what is provided, of course, and uh, uh, and ranking this multimedia according to the relevancy, of course, and much more uh, score. Yeah, so there's a really big difference mm -hmm. between 
X and then we do it in the My understanding, mm -hmm. and, I, and there was quite a lot of, uh, again, lectures on that information retrieval and images, there's a huge amount of differences. Uh, my understanding is that actually images don't have words. So, as such, they have the alt mm -hmm. description, the, the uh, mm -hmm. caption, and obviously the title, the toolkit title. Mm -hmm. But they don't, they're not like normal IR because that's mining, yeah, generally mining the text and like understanding the semantics and TFIDF, PM25, and all those things, yeah, the algorithmic analysis. Images mm -hmm. are categorized. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So even though an image might have words on, the words are not part of, they're not mined because they can't be seen mostly, other than a little bit of, you know, maybe some uh, artificial intelligence, um, deep learning uh, recognition on the words is in place now, potentially. But it's categorization uh, uh, mostly. So you'll see that a lot in Google Images. Things are placed into buckets. Buckets of, you know, if you look at Pomeranians, I see there's a picture there of a, a Pomeranian <laughs> picture. Yeah, one of my, that's my Bert and Ted. Uh, so if you look at Pomeranians in image search, you'll see actually that they are categorized by type, by picture, by uh, um, color, maybe. So, Mm. on that you add context in and around the image then you add a good good description don't just try and be spammy for the sake of seo mm. so show the images uh, images alt text is, is relevant bear in mind actually that actually images and the alt tag that comes with them uh, the alt tag was not intended originally for seo as neither were the h1 mm -hmm. the H6 uh, headings, uh, the meta headings, they were built for accessibility for people who, who mm -hmm. are using screen readers. That is more important than your, your spammy SEO. Yeah. So first and foremost, think accessibility when it comes to images. Images are huge, as you say, multimedia is massive. Uh, images are much more engaging. I would rather look at pictures of dresses than read about dresses if I'm looking to buy a dress. Uh, so, mm -hmm. yeah, I think spend a lot of time on images. I won't neglect them. Mm. So you totally agree with my idea that uh, the, the traditional text retrieval and uh, multimedia retrieval today interlink to each other and they are, they are important. They are, of course, massively important, but they're handled potentially in different ways. For instance, yes, of course. Uh, of course. Even mu music, music information retrieval is a field in itself, and that is really quite an interesting one. It's not one that I, I don't know a huge amount about that. It is a completely different. Uh, it's mm -hmm, different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, images are different as well. They're all broken down into bits, tiny, tiny, tiny pixels and fragmented. Uh, so again, really deep. The areas of search that you could go, you could literally, some people are creating them. Yeah. So you, you must think of these as all part of being under the same big banner of search. But some people say, mm -hmm. all, all websites that are, you know, major websites that are using any kind of search engine are in the field of information retrieval. Some of the best mm -hmm. retrieval practitioners are at huge sites that we know, such as Spotify. Um, mm -hmm. eBay, Amazon, uh, Booking.com, data scientists, it's all a big crossover. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, now, okay. uh, let me ask you uh, would you explain uh, more about the two important fields of uh, mobile internet, uh, mobile information, mm -hmm. field, sorry, context awareness and uh, context content adaptation? What kind of role do they play in uh, mobile information retrieval? Context awareness in... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so context awareness is actually really massively important to mobile search, mobile information retrieval. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's the understanding when trying to produce the, the most appropriate 
uh, information to meet a certain, uh, an information seeker's needs at that moment in time. So understanding intent, obviously, what did they mean by that? What did they mean by the query? Understanding the query in a different scenario. So say somebody is, uh, say somebody is, uh, you, as I say, traveling at, uh, on a motorway, <coughs> they're in a car on their phone and they're looking for restaurants. The chances are they don't want the results that they left behind <coughs> from home. So they want to know, it's probably more appropriate to return results based on the speed at which they're going, the destination. <coughs> Maybe potentially, I know that there are privacy things potentially to be contended with, but you might pull in other information based on, you know, their Google Assistant settings, where is home, where do they yeah. go to the industrial alert, where are they headed to, the things that they might be interested in, the things that they restaurants that they might have reviewed. As I said, there's a whole plethora of privacy things that also need to be mm -hmm. to consideration here. There's potentially user modeling that might also have a bearing. But context, <laughs> understanding, surroundings, location, device awareness, you know, what size of the screen that they're using, what are the different sensors that are available with the device that they are using, you know, pedometer, accelerometer, various other things. Uh, that's huge. Again, it's another huge field. Rich <coughs> Retrieval, again, a fabulous lecturer and a big, uh, well-known researcher in the field is Gabriella Passe. Uh, she's certainly somebody to read the papers of. Uh, she's a lecturer at a university here, I think. My, mm -hmm. I remember it's Glasgow. Uh, but again, Glasgow University do a huge amount of amazing stuff on information retrieval. They have their own uh, open source search engine called Terrier. Uh, um, again, they are yeah, really, really good researchers. So lots and lots of people you can follow. Uh, I think they have another Craig Campbell. I know we have our own in SEO, but I think if I'm not mistaken, there's a Craig Campbell in the, in the uh, IR world. Uh, not, I'm not saying that the word. Uh, I mean, perhaps Greg Campbell is quite a popular name in uh, in Glasgow, so it's probably. Uh, but yeah, uh, the other one, adaptive content. I presume you're talking about content that changes dependent on the device that people are using, and the whether it's on mobile. Are you talking about that with that? Uh, thank you again, and uh, we started recently talking about entities award do you believe that entities are important for a mobile in the mobile international international retrieval and why okay so first and foremost entities have always been important because if you've not read the book weaving the web by sir tim berners lee that is actually i mean it's quite old now uh, but it's still as relevant as ever and uh, it really is what the web was supposed to be about in the first place. Sorry, can you hear my Pomeranian barking? Mm, yeah, <laughs> no, no problem. Apologies, just it's that it's bird. She just come back in from a uh, from a walk. Mm. So uh, yeah, so entities were always important. Obviously, entities. Uh, every single every single page on Wikipedia is about an entity. Mm -hmm. That's why, part of the reason why, if you look at, you'll never really find anything that means the same two things on Wikipedia. They always have a disambiguation page. Mm -hmm. There's no one redirects to the other. There's such a thing as Wikipedia redirects or literally like mobile phone, mobiles, blah, 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 blah. They all redirect. And there are many, many things that are misinterpreted in, uh, in the English language, particularly. So... Mm -hmm. Entities help with disambiguation. Entities are utilized for conversational search. The knowledge graph is built with entities. Conversational yeah. search picks out the entities first. Entities do not necessarily have to be marked up with schema, structured data. If they are named and known in actual well structured web pages, they are extracted and then the gaps filled in around them. But actually, making sure that pages are well structured with cues 
and things like semi structured data, like unordered lists, tabular data, and so forth, and adding H1 through to even H6. Wikipedia for me is the most well structured web pages in the world, and people wonder why it's <coughs> so well and why it is mined by pretty much everybody in information retrieval. So they've always been important. Their uptake is being increasingly accelerated. It's great that more and more SEOs are starting to implement them. And that's only going to get bigger and better. Um, and um, yeah, it's, it's important for disambiguation. Even things that aren't necessarily used by Google, well, you know, they help with understanding the structure of the page. And I recommend that you read Reading the Web by Tim Berners Lee, because that was about every individual document being, if you like, mm -hmm. tagged. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, another book, yeah. Yeah, so wow. they're not new, just S SEOs are kind of, you know, only just realizing that actually there's value there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What literature? Another book, another free book, free book on this. Unbelievable. Christian Balog is a professor in entity research and information retrieval, currently on sabbatical at Google. Uh, he wrote a book and he's donated that. Uh, it's called uh, Entity Oriented Search. It's free by Springer. Uh, He's the keynote speaker at a uh, European Conference on Information Retrieval. I read that book in uh, March or April, February, March, April. I'm going to that uh, because I want to learn. Uh, I would recommend people look at that. But uh, it's a great gift by Christian to the whole of the search community because it's 300 pages long. It's a book all about search and entities, yeah. And how everything fits together, and you should you should uh, you should read it. So even if you just pick off a cat chapter at a time, it's free. Those books normally cost hundreds of pounds. So I download that uh, and just pick off a chapter at a time. It's about awareness, uh, mobile. It's about so many things, and that, it's a great it's a great a great read. Yeah, let's go to the final questions in the our webinar because we are out of time almost um what are your predictions for the future of seo this year do you think that we'll see some uh, surprising changes or not or, uh, do we, how we should change our strategy or not uh I think that we should be constantly trying to adapt our strategy to uh, what's important to our users because that our users, whatever website, whatever we're, we're, website we're operating on, the local audience as well, localization is massively important. I think there's going to be increasing temporal dynamics in the search results that we see because of query intent shift, um, i.e., when people do <coughs> something. There's a huge amount of fluctuation. I'm not saying that Google isn't constantly refining the algorithmic uh, quality res uh, results, and I don't think it's all that. I think a lot of it is around the changing needs of the audience, dependent on what people are looking for, where it is, where users are, what's popular at the time. Again, a video on this worth watching is uh, by Kira Rudinsky. She did the original papers on the. Uh, on a query intent shift that, that actually understood that Easter has many different meanings and uses one different type of result based on the exact same query at different times. <laughs> so a month before uh, Easter, people want to know when it is, the date, uh, when uh, two weeks before they're looking for things to do and actually on the day, they're looking for the meaning of Easter. Pretty much the same with most Internet, uh, most uh, public holidays or public celebrations or religious celebrations, whatever. Yeah, so I think there's going to be increasing levels of that as search engines begin to understand the changing contextual needs and intent on different devices. And I think rankings will always fluctuate massively and increase yeah. as well. Yeah, that's not to say you shouldn't keep working on your quality, but I think having a massive understanding of what your audience specifically 
needs how the how, UX is going to be important as well, making things as quick and simple to help people achieve the tasks and success that they're trying to accomplish. Yeah, I think search will become increasingly task driven. We're seeing that now. Um, yeah, I, th I think I think there's a, I think it's going to be a fast moving year, and I think it's yeah. going to be increasingly so. Yeah. Um, we have a final fun uh, question for you. There is a picture, you can see it. Uh, yeah. What is the most appropriate out tag for the picture? Is, what that, do you think? is that Bert? <laughs> is that Bert? All right, okay, so let's have, a, uh, let's have a quick look. I know this picture very well. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, it kind of looks a bit inappropriate, but what happens there, I'm not making any comments. But what happens there is, Bert, Bert is a really bad car traveller. He's always like really worried about travelling the car. As soon as Ted gets in the car, he literally just crashes out. He just falls asleep as soon as he gets there and sleeps all the way there. So I'm not going to add a comment, but what I would say is that one of those dogs, the black one, he just literally falls asleep like he, he's like a dormouse the minute he gets in a car. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> lovely, lovely. Um, do you have some final words for our audience? And uh, your yeah, I would, I would say really embrace, really embrace uh, learning more and more about uh, users on mobile. Uh, it's such an exciting area. Uh, obviously, a lot of people have great theories. Well, on this, Cindy Crum has really great theories. So. Certainly follow her work and her series. Uh, um, uh, some of the more, you know, the academics as well. I mentioned a lot of really great researchers working uh, in search engines as well. So look at practitioners in SEO, practitioners in industry, practitioners in huge websites that are working very hard to understand what people are looking for on mobile. And a lot of the academics as well that actually are much closer to this work in the actual field than you think. So, you know, the, the papers are very fast now. Not that they had to write a paper and five years later it gets published. It's very fast in current. Uh, so look at conference proceedings because they're often very current. Yeah, so thank you again for having me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dawn, and thank you everybody thank you, with us today. Thanks to our team for their great work during the webinar. We'll be expecting uh, next month and we'll announce our guest, next guest very soon. Okay. Man, right. don't forget to follow us on YouTube and uh, where you can find uh, useful knowledge and information. Thank you, down again for being with us and sharing your knowledge and tips. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.